It's uh, a real pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for coming out in such uh, uh, robust numbers. I know it's uh, always a challenge between elections, particularly after an election defeat like we faced uh, in 2011, um, to gather as liberals. But I think the time uh, for us to gather not just as liberals, but as Canadians, uh, has come. We're reaching, I think, the end of a cycle of cynicism in politics. We've been so negative about our leaders, about politics, about our political parties, about our capacity collectively to make decisions that are in the greater good, to make decisions for the long term, uh, that I think it's time we came back to that. I think when we face and look honestly at the challenges that we are facing, whether it be around the environment, whether it be around uh, poverty, whether it be around social justice and human rights, we're facing, and not just as communities or provinces or even as a country, as a planet, we're facing massive challenges. And it's going to require us, all of us, to start taking on differently our responsibilities as citizens. Being a citizen used to be able to be summarized in three things. Paying your taxes, voting every now and then, and obeying the law. And if you, could, if you did that, you were pretty much considered to be a good citizen. We now have to understand that it needs to go a step further than that. We have to begin to be aware every step of the way of our impact as members of a community. Being a citizen is fundamentally someone who understands that they are part of a greater whole, part of a community, of a social network that we are building every day contributing to, working for, and prospering by. We need to understand that how we connect to each other is far more important than how we are different from each other. And unfortunately, we've been stuck in a political rut over the past years that is focusing on our differences, where whether you're red or blue or orange or green, you are defined by that and you disagree with anyone of a different color. I have information to remind you, Canada's not like that. We're not a country of polarization. We are a country of differences. From sea to sea to sea, the differences define this country urban to rural, French to English, east to west, young to old, all the different religions, all the different languages and backgrounds, all the different cultures that come together, define us in a way that, yes, makes it difficult for us to point out what is a typical Canadian, who is a typical Canadian. But we are defined through and strengthened, not in spite of our differences, but because of those differences. Because if it's hard to point out what a typical Canadian looks like or sounds like, there is one thing that defines us, that binds us together. And that's a collective set of shared values. Values of openness, respect, compassion, a willingness to work hard to succeed, yes, but a desire to be there for our neighbors when they fall upon times of trouble. Where does that come from? It comes a little bit from you know, the French and the English having to figure out how to live together and learn, in a large part, from our native communities who figured out how to live in a land that was too big and too cold too many months of the year. But more than that, we're a country that knows that in this land that is too vast and too sparsely populated, and far too often, far too cold, although this winter was a bit of an exception, <laughs> we need to lean on each other. We need to be open to each other. We need to be there for each other. 
Whether you came here tens of thousands of years ago or 500 years ago with the first European settlers or you know, a few years ago with our recent waves of immigration. Everyone faces the same realities and everyone realizes that in a land like this we need to be there for each other. So the fact that we've had the politics of division over the past few years, the politics of strategically selecting who's likely to vote for you and mobilizing them, noticing who's unlikely to vote for you no matter what you do or say, so full out ignoring them, or even campaigning against them to get the ones you want. Look at the wedge issues in communities, Look at the divisions in this country and play them up as a way of getting elected. I got news for you. It works. <laughs> the current prime minister we have with a majority government is proof that strategically selecting issues and voter groups and regions is a way to get yourself elected. But what we're beginning to see is that it's not necessarily, and actually, it's impossible, once you get elected that way, to then turn around and govern for the good of the entire country. Right. So right now in Ottawa, we have two political parties. Two political parties who form government and opposition who are, in fact, the flip sides of the same coin. You have Mr. Mulcair and the NDP who are worried about the West and campaigning against the West and the money from our natural resources coming in there. And you have Stephen Harper who plants himself in the West and is running against Quebec and against the East. And you have to wonder who's standing up for Canada. When both political parties, and in the choice of Mr. Mulcair, and I don't want to spend too much time talking about them, but I do want people to understand that when you look at the political landscape and you see that both the government party and the opposition control the agenda so completely in the House and you realize that the two men leading each of those parties are very similar in their approach to politics, in their experience as politicians, as their, uh, uh, of their top-down perspectives, of the iron fist that they're beginning to rule that in one case, our Prime Minister does rule his caucus with, and in the other case, we're beginning to see that the leader of the opposition controls his caucus with. We realize that there is an extraordinary opportunity to be more, to move differently, to choose to bring people together instead of driving them apart. When you have parties that are picking regions, and subgroups within those regions to play to, the question begins to ask, who speaks for Canada? Because yes, you can divide a country like this. But when you do that, you're putting aside the great thing that we have achieved here collectively. At a time when the world is facing massive challenges, and the world needs the kinds of solutions Canada can offer. Our capacity to say you know, to every country in the world, despite their pressures around immigration, around different nationalities coming together, say, you know what, there's a way to make it work. Despite the newcomers, despite the flow of technologies, despite the challenges you are facing, we made it work. We got beyond identity as a defining case for our country, and we've moved to values. We've moved to engaged citizenship. We've moved to understanding 
that there is more to building a country than waving a flag. It's in how we connect with each other. It's in how we build with each other. It's in how we focus not on scaring people, but on making things happen. This country didn't happen by accident. It took hard work. It took dedication by Canadians of goodwill, Canadians who understood the importance of their communities and built for those communities. It took people coming together. Now, if you look at politics these days, the pundits will tell you that that's a dated, utopic view of Canada. That the idea of bringing people together is no longer what we're all about, and we just have to try and get along despite our differences. That the idea of building on our common concerns, hopes, and dreams is not the way politics is done anymore. Well, I tell you, liberals believe, liberals know that there is a better way, and we intend to prove it. And the reason we know that we can do this is because of the example, the example that was provided for us right here in Ontario. During the Harris years, the Liberal Party, during the years before that as well, the Liberal Party was looked at as being out of touch. And the Liberals worked very, very hard to reconnect with people. People said the Tory machine was bigger, stronger, meaner, richer, and Ontarians wouldn't respond to a positive vision, a better vision. The Ontario Liberals proved them wrong. They proved that people respond to a positive vision. People respond to being called upon to be something bigger and better. And that's what we start to need for Canada once again. As we look at the young people who are protesting in my home province of Quebec, the jeunes qui se sentent déconnectés du gouvernement, qui cherchent la démocratie de rue, People who feel disconnected from the government are looking for, for, for attention and awareness to come from the streets. These young people don't want to be protesting. They don't want to be part of a broken system. But they feel they need to share their anger, their concerns. They feel they're not being listened to. And right across the country, the way this government has approached young people has been to marginalize them has been to poo-poo their concerns and dismiss them. Young people who stand up and say, where are you going on the environment? How are you dealing with the future that I'm having? As my grandparents age and I'm going to have to get a job to keep them healthy and engaged and valued by their community, how are you going to make sure that I get a good enough job to be able to make up for all the baby boomers retiring? And nobody has a plan for them. Nobody has a plan for the environment. Nobody has a plan to fight poverty. Nobody has a plan to have Canada play once again on the world stage as a force for good. Because those plans require vision. And they require a willingness to not be satisfied with band-aids. And that requires a leap of faith, not just by our government, but by our citizens.